Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. I'm grateful for your attendance at our, this lecture today. My name is Brendan Rensink. I'm Associate Director of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies and an Associate Professor of History here at BYU. Um, the Red Center, along with the BYU Art History and Curatorial Studies Program, are co-sponsoring this event, and we're, we're happy to have you all here. Um, I did want to make a couple announcements of upcoming events that the Red Center is sponsoring. Later this afternoon at 2 o'clock, uh, we have a double header today for the, at the Red Center um, in 1060 HBLL, the large um, auditorium in the basement of the uh, library. Um, we'll be um, hosting um, Professor Alexia Williams from the University of Illinois, um, a professor of religion and African American studies, and she'll be giving a talk entitled Black Patroness of the Rockies the life and legacy of Julia Greeley, black Catholic on the path to sainthood. And then looking another uh, week uh, further on March 7th, uh, we'll be hosting our annual Annalee Nagley Red lecture. Our speaker will be um, the recently retired uh, historian Elliot West, and he'll be speaking about his book, Continental Reckoning, the American West in the Age of Expansion. Um, we'll start today with a prayer from Red Center Director Jay Buckley, after which um, one of our art history professors in the um, uh, Department of Col Comparative Arts and Letters, Heather Belknap, will offer um, an introduction for our speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Emily Burns. Emily Burns is director of the Charles M. Russell Center for the Study of Art of the American West and an associate professor of art history at the University of Oklahoma. Burns is a scholar of the transnational 19th century with an interdisciplinary research practice that analyzes artists and works of art moving through space and between cultures with a focus on relationships between the US and Native American artists, as well as dialogues between French, US, and Native American artists. She is the author of Transnational Frontiers, The American West in France, published by University of Oklahoma Press in 2018, and co-editor of Mapping Impressionist Painting in Transnational Contexts with Alice M. Rudy Price, published with Routledge in 2021, and also of Routledge's Companion to Art and Empire, Imperialism and Aesthetics, which is forthcoming this year. She's also the co-editor for an issue of Transatlantica on the American West in France. Burns has published articles about US art in Paris, the circulation of Lakota performers and art, US exhibition histories, US sculpture in public spaces, and US impressionism. She earned a BA in art history from Union College, an MA in art history and theory from the George Washington University, and a PhD in art history and archeology span from Washington University in St. Louis. At Oklahoma University, she teaches courses on American art and the art of the American West. Uh, Dr. Burns is a, a colleague of several of your BYU professors, and this is at least the second time right, that we welcome uh, her back. She was here about 10 years uh, ago for a national symposium on transatlanticism and the arts. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Burns. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I want to begin by noting that the research for this talk and its writing was completed at the University of Oklahoma, which is on the traditional home of the Hasnai Caddo Nation and the Kirikiris, Wichita, and affiliated tribes. This territory once also served as a hunting ground, trade exchange point, and migration route for the Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, and Osage nations. Today, 39 tribal nations dwell in the state of Oklahoma as a result of settler and colonial policies that were designed to assimilate native people. Provo is on the traditional homelands of the Nuchi, the word for the people in Ute, and of indigenous people who have stewarded the land throughout generations. And these histories and their legacies fundamentally shape the research that I'm about to share. And I'm really excited to introduce um, some material that I've been working on just for about the last year. Um, and thank you to BYU, um, many colleagues, um, both um, Heather Belknap and James Swenson in art history, 
um, as well as colleagues from the Red Center, Jay Buckley and Brendan Resnick um, for hosting me. I also want to thank Brenda Hickman for organizing logistics, and it's been wonderful to see um, other faces of people with whom I've collaborated on various other projects here today. Um, thank you, and I really look forward to your feedback on this material. I also want to thank Spencer Wigmore, who is the editor and leader on the project for which this is going to be an article, um, J.R. Henneman, um, Megan Evans, who is a BYU alum in art history, who is currently a PhD candidate um, working with me at OU, um, Leslie Thompson um, from the Sid Richardson, who took really beautiful details of this painting we're going to talk about today, um, and also Heather Caverhill, who has done some amazing work on um, Blackfeet histories and artists kind of a few decades after Russell's time that we'll be talking talking about today. Today's talk will center on a single painting by Charles M. Russell from 1911 in the wake of the Buffalo Hunters, and you see it on the screen. Typical of Russell's paintings of Native American subjects in Montana, the painting imagines a group of Blackfeet people on horseback above a butte. A central figure stands tall, craning to look over the edge in the distance. A mood of anticipation is echoed by the focused gazes and the direction of the sunlight. Russell's title helps us narrate a story. Native Americans trailing a buffalo hunt, waiting for the hunt to end, to follow down into the butte and butcher the animals to prepare the meats, hides, and organs for a variety of purposes in Blackfeet lifeways. Russell's rendering of Native American life made him famous during his lifetime and today. His paintings are often extolled for their truths and affirming facts of the Old West. From the 1880s, Russell was based in Montana, building a home and studio in Great Falls on ancestral Blackfoot territory, enabled by histories of US settlement in the region, a practice often referred to as settler colonialism, a form of colonization in which a population displaces an existing population, seeking to absorb it into its own political entity. The native people of this region are the Nitsapi, the real people, also sometimes referred to as Siksiketsitapi, or the Blackfeet speaking people of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, and this comprises four bands um, the Siksika, or Blackfoot, the Kaine, or Blood, and two sections of the Pagan, or Pikani, uh, people. And so Blackfoot is the overarching term for this nation or confederacy. And then the term Blackfeet is specific to the Southern Pecani. Montana was declared a US state in 1889 after a series of land cessations by the bands of the Blackfoot Confederacy on both sides of the US-Canada border. Russell arrived in the region during the US and Canadian government's longstanding attempts to quell nomadic practices to make way for further settlement by their own societies. This history bears tremendous violence, notably in the Marias Bear Creek Massacre of 1870, in which the US military killed approximately 217 pagan people who were peaceably camped. Decimation of the bison herd central to the Blackfoot cultural lifeways, as well as death through smallpox epidemic, further ruptured ancestral practices. Settler policies also imposed cultural violence through missionization, laws banning Ukon, or the Sundance, and the establishment of agencies um, all sought to assimilate Native people. The severe depletion of reservation lands between 1873 and 1896 fundamentally shifted migratory patterns and interrupted Blackfoot spiritual practice which as anthropologist Gerald Oatler shows is tied to quote, the landscape as an archive or repository of traditional knowledge. This is a space of entwined relationships among people, animals, nature, land, through which ritual migrations, um, quoting again from Oatler, fulfill spiritual obligations. So this is the historical backdrop embedded in Russell's geography. In addition to his home in Great Falls, the artist purchased land near, near um, Lake McDonald, um, oh sorry, here we are, uh, in Glacier National Park um, from a white homesteader in the 1890s, and he built a studio and cabin, which you see on the right, in 1907. This park is adjacent to the Southern Pecani or Blackfeet Reservation, as you can see in the map on the left. And Russell often painted here, as well as to the south in the Flathead Reservation and the east at Fort Belknap, a reservation formed in 1885 that combined Nakota um, or Assiniboine people with Gros Venture people. And so these dates of um, kind of rearrangement and reservation building are concurrent with Russell's 
presence. And it's worth noting that he's interfacing with various tribal nations and cultures um, in this location. To gain access to indigenous societies and to affirm the context he imagined in his paintings, Russell collected hundreds of works of art by native artists through gift or purchase, uh, through friends, models, at trading posts, and also reservation events that he sometimes attended. He included much of the material he acquired in his paintings, and he also sometimes reworked objects or made replicas of them or his own versions of um, in indigenous belongings. And in the wake of the buffalo hunters, for instance, you can note right really at the center of the canvas, a tobacco bag, a beaded dress with belt and knife sheath, a cradle board, and the wood poles of a travois used to transport goods uh, behind horses. Trade is inflected by the Hudson Bay blanket on the central horse, that um, uh, striped blanket you see there. In publications about Russell's studio and the longstanding display of these belongings in his studio museum, um, such objects have not been understood as works of art, but um, rather scholars have variously called them props, mementos, materials, artifacts, and also Indian gear. These semantic choices, I suggest, affirm the artist's vision for rendering an authentic West, and they suppress the complicated transnational exchange and artistic experimentation that was occurring in the making, acquisition, and intermedia translation of these native belongings. And this term belonging, I'm sort of replacing here um, uh, the, the, for the term object, and this is drawing on Karuk scholar of baskets, um, Carolyn Smith. In this talk, I want to complicate the persistent centering of Russell's vision by constellating other stories around this painting that highlight the artist's transnational engagements with Native American makers and sitters, that take seriously the belongings as material that isn't easily shoehorned into Russell's storytelling, and that suggests how such belongings may have influenced Russell's thinking about abstraction. What follows is in four parts. The first, posing, traces the role of Russell's longtime Blackfeet model, Josephine Wright, who is often obscured from the scholarly conversation about Russell's art. The second, circulating, centers the native belongings in Russell's collection as agentic beings, which carry the native epistemologies or knowledge systems embedded in their making. In a discussion of indigenous aesthetics, Choctaw and Chickasaw scholar Heather Autone has described, quote, each indigenous culture globally has an aesthetic system that represents the total of its epistemology and philosophies, its history and its knowledge. I argue that both these modes of being and of animacy are not effaced in Russell's repurposing of these belongings. The third section speculates on Russell's ambivalent experiments with modernism as perhaps in dialogue with these belongings. And then in a final section, I'll propose a methodological shift that I see as needed in the field of Western American art to more deeply engage with Native American and indigenous studies, to understand the collection and, repre and representation of Native belongings so frequently practiced by Western painters like Russell and many others. Rather than seeing in the wake of the Buffalo Hunters as Russell's nostalgic document or a fantasy of the Old West, I interpret the painting as an unresolved contest of settler and native epistemologies. As Blackfeet people track the bison hunt in the painting, I, Russell, I argue, is tracking Native American art, and his dependence on it casts him perpetually in its wake. Okay, part one, posing. Josephine Wright was a Blackfeet model who posed for hundreds of Russell paintings in oil and watercolor, as well as sculptures, and appeared at the center of In the Wake of the Buffalo Hunters. In this scene, she models for scout, butcher, tanner, mother, community, member, and transporter of goods all in one. Wright is only scantly mentioned in the scholarship on Russell, but once her visage is recognized, she circulates constantly through Russell's work. Wright's granddaughter, Nancy Josephine Clark, compiled, compiled many relevant paintings in a talk she gave at the Russell Museum in 2018. And of about 5,000 paintings attributed to Russell, there are hundreds where we can see this particular model's face. Wright became involved with Russell's art practice through her friendship and co-working with Nancy Cooper, who married Russell in 1896. Wright and Cooper met as live-in household help, cleaning and raising children at the home of Ben and Layla Roberts in Cascade, Montana. Sources suggest their long-standing friendship, 
And when Wright married Northern Pacific Railroad worker Frederick Tharp in 1903, the Russells acted as witnesses. And here you can see their wedding certificate with a drawing by Russell of the bouquet on the back of the page. <coughs> All right. Wright acted as a cultural broker between Blackfeet and settler worlds. We have scant details about their conversations about Blackfeet life, but she is often shown in photographs situated visibly as an interface between Russell and his ever-growing collection of native belongings. Um, most of these photos are in a studio context. Um, in this one, they sit on the floor in an alcove in Russell's home in Great Falls. Wright sits among um, the Hudson Bay trading blanket that you see in the painting, um, and she here wears a blackfoot beaded dress and necklace and holds a calumet or a peace pipe, a smoking pipe. The alcove is filled with native belongings. You can see two painted hides, a tobacco bag, a shield, a medicine bundle, a buffalo horn bonnet, a backrest, and more. Later extant photographs taken outside Russell's log cabin studio depict Wright with her long hair in braids, wearing a Blackfeet dress. Russell here wears a coat made from Hudson Bay trade blankets called a capote, which was given by a Cree man named Buffalo Coat in 1900. Russell also wears white beads, a braided wig, and a fur and feather cap, which is actually his own assembly. He holds a rifle and tobacco bag. These photographs each present Wright's face in slightly different placements of profile and probably functioned as reference photographs for Russell's paintings. Um, but Russell's own posing can be tracked as a visual model for, for instance, part of um, his portrait of Buffalo Coat in honor of that gift in 1908. A third photograph appears more candidly of Wright. She sits on the ground, cradling a calumet, looking directly at the camera and smiling. We need to be careful not to declare Russell's paintings of rights as portraits. He's quite flexible in how he adapts her visage, and her circulation in genre scenes is distinct from the buffalo court coat portrait that I just showed you. Yet, as a Blackfeet woman working in Russell's studio, we can trace, as John Ott has done for Taos Society of Artists painter Ernest Blumenshine's long relationship with one of his models, how she operates simultaneously in two worlds amid tremendous change for her nation and repression of her community's right to practice religion, culture, and custom. Further, as a model, we might be tempted to assume that she is playing herself, but as Judith Butler has shown us, there is always an unknowable gap between the individual we present to the world and the interior self, and she might have leveraged this opportunity to navigate assimilation policies and to affirm her Blackfeet identity in performance through Russell's paintings. Through her cultural brokering, Russell's imagined West was, not, was fundamentally shaped not only by her labor, but also the artistry and labor embedded in belongings such as the Blackfeet dress. Not necessarily a costume that she's wearing for Russell's paintings, the dress speaks to Blackfeet worldviews that affirm relationality entwined between human, natural, and spiritual worlds. And this brings us to part two. Examples from Russell's collection enable us to trace competing epistemologies at work in the dialogue created by Russell's paintings with the native belongings in them. Russell's perspective, as I mentioned at the start, reiterated by scholars, reads these as objects, artifacts, and props. But within the various Northern Plains knowledge systems, these are belongings imbued with cultural and social meanings that make them animate and agentic. Um, and here's a few photographs of Russell's studio, and I'll focus on the one at the right, um, where Russell is um, painting a picture called Who's Meat? And you can see many pieces from his collection. There's Blackfeet beadwork, along with a warrior shirt, which he acquired at a 1905 Sundance at Fort Belknap. And I'm not going to talk about that warrior shirt today, but I'm happy to answer questions about it later if you'd like to talk further about it. You can also see the Blackfeet dress often worn by Wright hanging on the wall over the easel. As early as 1892, a review of this cowboy artist described, quote, he has with him a collection of Indian relics collected by himself at different trading posts, and they form an interesting study of paraphernalias dear to the wandering tribes who once roamed unmolested through these regions, end quote. This note suggests a public perception that these objects represented a pre-contact past, although Rick Stewart, Annika Johnson, and others have traced how many of these native belongings appearing in his paintings actually don't date from the earlier period, but rather to the reservation era itself. And this produces a visual anachronism 
um, that um, paradoxically sustains perceptions of Russell's pictures as an authentic index of the past. Um, and it also affirms his insider knowledge of traditional native life on the Northern Plains. Um, reinforcing the belief often printed in newspapers, um, and here I quote again, that Russell has lived among Indians until they have looked upon him as a white brother, and to him they have told many of their stories and legends, which a tourist might in vain attempt to gather. These belongings materially authenticated his paintings and energized his purported access um, to indigenous cultures. Scenes like in the wake of the buffalo hunters depend on this careful rendering of these belongings with ethnographic detail. But instead of authenticating Russell's images, I suggest that when we look closely, these belongings trouble it. The belongings are mostly made by Plains women, Many of them remain in the Russell Museum in Great Falls, and the belongings have their own lives, meanings, functions, and significations for Plains nations. When we expand our thinking to address them on their own terms, we can restore those meanings to our framing of the painting. The ontologies, or fundamental identity, of these belongings embed and express Native knowledge, and not only from Blackfeet makers. For example, the inclusion of a cradle board in, in the wake of the buffalo hunters evokes a belonging in many Plains Native life ways. Um, the one painted here is not extant. Um, Nancy Russell brought some of the belongings with her to California after Russell's death, um, and these materials were dispersed. Um, but I have put in an example from the Diker collection um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that is similar to the one that Russell um, paints here with brass tacks and geometric beadwork on the side, of which you can see just a small amount in Russell's painting. The wood frame of the cradle board visible behind the model is akin to Kiowa and Cheyenne cradle boards of the Southern Plains, but uh, this function of special belongings is consistent across the plains. One could scarcely imagine a more intimate belonging. Love, wishes, energies, prayer are all embedded in a beaded cradle board, which operates in Sichangula Quota artist Mitchell Zephyr's terms as a, quote, extension of the mother's womb and an extension of the extended family. As Ogallala Lakota curator Emile Hermenihorses notes, quote, considered gifts from the creator, the construction, beading technique, designs, and colors on each of these cradle boards are meant to physically and spiritually protect a child. In a Kiowa context, cradle boards and bed shared offerings from both parents. The wood frame is made by the father and the mother and other women in the community produce the beading. As Kiowa curator and beater Terry Greaves and curator Jill Alberg yo describe, quote, imbuing it with meaning and protective ornaments. They work together with baby in mind and heart to create the exquisite and durable first earthly bed for their beloved child, their Ade. This representation of multi-generational and community relations retains signification and significance even in this new painted context. Another key example is the Blackfeet dress worn by Wright in the photographs and that appears both in the wake of the buffalo hunters and also the watercolor you see at left, um, Sun Worship in Montana of 1907. Um, and this dress remains in Russell's collection and I'm grateful to Sarah Adcock for sending the photograph this is a two-hide dress with beaded line stitching, also referred to as lane stitching, in blue and black seed beads, which in the angled light in, in the wake of the buffalo hunters registers as red. This dress would have been tanned, sewn, and beaded by a Blackfoot, Blackfeet woman around 1900, and it follows many community conventions. I was actually thinking last night about like the amount of time and labor to produce one garment, um, which is kind of foreign to us in our kind of society and um, structure of um, sort of fast fashion. Here, the design of the yoke dips lower at the center, and this echoes earlier examples in which the animal tail would have appeared in this place. So the animal form remains implied and embeds that relationship. You'll notice also additional jingles, which glint in the light of the painting, would have enhanced the dynamism of the dress, and they also would have produced sound um, to enable propriety to let others know when a woman was entering the space. The dress is adorned with a buckskin fringe and an additional row of beading along the base and neckline. The dress is an example of what scholars call expressive culture. As Kiowa scholar Jenny Tonpaho describes, regalia, adornment, figural art, and dance mingle together. And this is also kind of pushing us to a more expansive idea of what we often talk about in art history. Um, 
But this highlights how the animacy of belongings is extended through dynamic wearing, um, material painstakingly made from natural and trade materials. The ability to make, as well as social protocols, was given to Blackfoot women as a spiritual gift from Elk Woman to strengthen kinship ties within all humans' relational realms. Blackfoot language includes a particular term for a manly-hearted woman who were strong and active in their communities in encouraging intergenerational relationships, negotiation, and even sometimes battle. The perpetuation and renewal of human sacred natural relations um, through making is centered in the use of this term sometimes um, for women who produced such belongings. These women makers embedded um, what is called in the Blackfoot language, mokaksini, or knowledge, in the belongings they produced. The materials themselves link artists and wearers to an animacy of relations. Literally, a life force embedded in material forms is a central part of Blackfeet beliefs, as um, historian Rosaline, Rosaline Lapierre has explored. Um, so adapting these animal materials affirms perpetually for the wearer, in Greaves and Yo's terms, the sense that, quote, we are related to it, and it relates back. Made belongings, in other words, solidify the entwinement between material and spiritual realms, bind communities relation, relationally between each other and with non-human animacies, and perpetuate cultural continuity. Beading continues to be practiced among um, many uh, native nations of the Northern Plains. Um, Métis Canadian contemporary beater and curator Sherry farrell Reset, who has um, done amazing um, curatorial projects on beading and also written about beading, um, argues that the act of beading is more important than the beadwork itself. She writes, each stitch can be a transformative, transformational action. The gesture of stitching, the tiny precise movements created by the piercing needle that secures a, a strand of beads to the surface, it can tether emotion or be a gesture of claiming or one of letting go. This sensibility ties with, the sp with spiritual connection, and this continues to the present as a Cinnaboyne bead artist, Juanito Growing Thunder, whose brightly colored geometric beadwork you see here on this pack saddle, recalls of her mother, Joyce Growing Thunder's beading, quote, there are spirits that come along with beading. Thoughts, feelings, layered connections, as well as multi-generational dialogues as embodied by the Growing Thunder Collective are embedded in the material fabric of the beadwork and imbibe it with an animacy that communicates in perpetuity. As Yola argues, quote, materials are intricately, intricately linked to multiple social non-human centric relationships and native ways of knowing in which belongings are active participants. As Richard West has pointed out, dresses are much more than simple articles of clothing for Native women. They are complex expressions of culture and identity. Greaves notes that a beater is always working on multiple levels, not just in terms of knowing how to work with the medium technically, but also how to work symbolically within the language of beating. And scholars have linked these different designs to Blackfeet origin stories, to metaphysics, because they enact connections between human and spirit worlds and foster this relationality. So when Wright wears this dress and it is rendered in oil painting, why would we imagine that such layered meanings would disappear? Intriguingly, the dress in Russell's collection departs slightly from Blackfeet convention. Many examples of um, Blackfeet dresses and more broadly Blackfoot dresses also include a triangle and round patterns on the lower part of the dress. And you can see it in the examples that you see at the left and right of the one in Russell's collection. Um, and scholars have identified this motif as symbolic of the head and kidney of the animal whose organs were used to soften the hide, such as in this dress um, made in about 1860 by Siksika Blackfoot, Mrs. Running Rabbit. And these motifs, again, re reaffirm that relationality between human and animal realms. And I don't have a firm answer on this yet, but I'm interested that the, these elements are not on the dress that Russell has. Um, I'm hoping to spend more time in the um, Blackfeet communities um, this summer, and this is one of the like top questions on my list um, about how strong these conventions and protocols are. Um, and one possibility is that it could suggest that Russell may have acquired an object that was actually designed for sale rather than for community use. And given that Blackfeet women beating collectives, which still operate today, long controlled the sale of Blackfeet belongings in trading posts, including the one in Glacier National Park, it is possible to speculate that Russell had access to a subtly different type of dress created for trade. <laughs> 
stay tuned on that. Irrespective of whether Russell's dress is adapted uh, from a version of Blackfeet dress, its ability to express an embedded knowledge, even if guarded, is not diluted. Its representation in his paintings does not necessarily occlude or suppress its originary context. The belongings retain their embedded epistemological links to the cultures who made and used them. As Yoa reminds us, even in the context when artists' names are dissociated from their production, and this is often the case for beadwork um, from the late 19th century, which you'll see in museums, um, and she argues, quote, the object's intimacy and agency are intermingled with the maker's intentions. The maker remains present. These belongings are also activated in their mobility through representation as they affirm continued Blackfoot presence. The continued practice of beating in the face of settler colonialism is a defiant act of cultural production. Ancestral practices and community dialogues continue to pass cultural knowledge and relational belonging during a period of fierce suppression. The belongings communicate to the initiated, as Sisseton, Wapitan, Dakota, and Hunk Papa, Lakota, and Dakota artist Gracie Horn has articulated, established artistic practices, established abstract symbolism, the way we convey our lives, our families, our belief systems, worldviews, language, all of that is embedded in these things. That is what continues forward. Um, an anthropologist who has mostly worked on Lakota beadwork, uh, Marsha Clift Bull, argues in terms that apply, I think, at large, quote, art can operate as a potent force in maintaining a cultural self-image due to its high visibility and yet non-aggressive character. And this is especially true with abstract motifs. And the designs on the beaded belongings in Russell's studio mostly bear abstract symbols with meanings and reference known only to the beater and initiated members of her community. For Russell, his contemporaries, and for non-initiated observers today, there is often opacity around the meanings and messages in native beadwork abstractions, and this in many instances productively protects indigenous knowledge. Russell's representations of the beadwork and its possible influence on his own style is more about the surface, and we'll talk about that in a second, rather than a deliberate synergy with Blackfeet beliefs and animacy or relationality. And regardless of what Russell did or did not understand about these meanings, they are um, kind of traveling through the belongings. As Blackfeet historian Rosalind LaPere has beautifully argued about the Blackfeet stories that were shared with anthropologists concurrent with Russell's practice, a, a frequent misrepresentation or distortion of what those stories meant about Blackfeet epistemology does not erase the beliefs that are embedded there. And she has done a lot of work to go back through these early um, shared stories um, to kind of recontextualize them with her understandings of Blackfeet beliefs. As with Russell's paintings, embedded meanings do not need to be legible to all to be legible to some. The curator Heather Atun also notes, um, quote, it is likely because indigenous cultures were perceived as primitive that aesthetic systems, such as the abstract beadwork, were not seen as a threat. Um, indigenous arts were seen merely as decorative crafts, thereby protecting the things we made from the same assaults directed at our ceremonies and language. The continued production of belongings, as well as their role in Northern Plains expressive culture, belies presumptions of Native American decimation, and it's often occurring under the radar of settler colonial um, pressures. But in the context of Russell's assertions of a nostalgic pre-contact West, these belongings and their presence making um, works against those erasures. By restoring native meanings and messages to belongings in Russell's paintings, we might even go so far as to suggest that these unnamed women makers become subtle and unacknowledged co-producers of meaning. We can also, as we move to part three, grow this claim into another speculative space by thinking about women makers of abstract imagery as a subtle artistic influence on Russell's practice. The lead on this project, Spencer Wigmore, has noted scholars' tendency to run headlong into finding the stories in Russell's pictures, often overlooking the complex materiality and selective moderating between naturalism and abstraction in parts of his paintings. What happens when we retune our perception to center his handling? Around the representations of native people and belongings which are often presented with precise ethnographic detail, the settings often dissipate into loose and washy brushstrokes. Um, in the wake of the buffalo hunters, it's an example of this. 
more than half of the composition is given over to ground and sky, and the farther away from the central grouping, the more open and gestural Russell's handling becomes. There are traces of thick impasto, and at times a scraping away of the surface um, in non-mimetic passages. Russell delights in materials in ways that run counter to the storytelling practices that scholars emphasize. Is this attention to materiality and making a signifier of modernism? Russell was a vocal anti-modernist. Um, in addition to embedding himself, himself in a nostalgic West, he often spoke with vitriol about abstraction in European contexts. In the infamous letter that you see on the screen, when his paintings were shown in 1914 at Dore Galleries in London, adjacent to an exhibition of paintings of Italian futurism, Russell lambasted modernist abstraction. To a reviewer, Russell joked that he would liquor up his friends and, quote, cure the women anarchists uh, by putting them in the gallery with these paintings, which he saw as akin to a child's kaleidoscope. And in this letter to his friend, he includes a caricature of his skeptical self on a tour with a feut, uh, looking askance at a painting of dynamic dynamism. So Russell's really mocking abstraction, but a close look at his art practice suggests that he may have explored it in subtle ways um, that draw on perhaps the source of the belongings in his collection, in the shapes, in the color, and in the impasto, which is the art historical term for the buildup of paint on the surface. For instance, in, in the wake of the Buffalo Hunters, the color scheme seems indebted to the color beading on the regalia. Note the violet shadows and the blue highlights on the figures, on the horses, and dappled lightly throughout the painting that emerge from that beaded yoke. One can trace touches of teal from the Hudson Bay trading blanket in the grass, and the bright blue from the beads on the Blackfeet regalia reiterate throughout the ground. The equilateral triangles that point upwards to the sky on the tobacco bag fluttering in the breeze echo in the purple shadows, rendering the folds of the Blackfeet dress above it. The Eamon Carter conservator Jody Utter, who has looked at an amazing array of Russells, has studied how Russell tends to employ selective impasto on his surfaces in both oil and in watercolor. Utter notes that Russell often, quote, shaped paint with bright color to convey decoration. In Sun Worship in Montana, Russell includes regular dabs of paint to build the jingles in the top fringe of the Blackfeet dress and along the sash that drapes from his belt. Is Russell painting like beading? There seems to be deliberate flattening and delight in shapes, parceling in color in unmixed saturated layers. Beading, weaving, painting, all parcel color by bead, thread, and stroke in ways that in invite us to read his paintings also as subtle and unstated commingling of makers within an asymmetrical context. Might we see this as an ambivalent modernism that emerges instead of his scorned futurism, futurist painting um, from unspoken dialogues with native belongings? Addressing this possible aesthetic trajectory um, and how um, this, these beaded surfaces may have made an impact on Russell's practice also helps us to rebalance histories of abstraction, which typically omit the multi-general abstractions of women beaters from the history of modernism that's always all about futurism and other um, European movements. Certainly, Russell fancied himself a native maker. He frequently dressed in red face, or playing Indian, as part of his artistic persona. He also painted self-portraits um, in native guises, um, perhaps most uh, famously in the picture robe of 1899, where he draws himself um, as if a native person drawing a horse on a buckskin robe inside of a teepee filled with Blackfoot belongings. In another watercolor imagining a self-portrait in Russell's studio, he also sits a native figure beside him holding a calumet and observing, perhaps judging the outcome. Some have suggested that this may be a representation of young boy, who you see on the left in this photograph, a Cree man who was the brother of Buffalo Coat, who I mentioned before. Um, but I also wonder if this couldn't be a double self-portrait of Russell, um, uh, including the kind of na native alter ego um, that he sometimes engages. Um, and thinking about the role of this um, kind of playing Indian invites us to address in conclusion the methodological implications of this discussion. In UPAC artist Stephen Foster and Snohomish leader Mike Evans note in a recent article that the objectification of native belongings centers what they call surveying rather than relationships. 
And they say that um, this um, kind of taking places them in a fiction of non-relational reality. And when I read this phrase, I was like, bingo, this is what I'm trying to get at. Um, this powerful phrase speaks to how Russell's repurposing of belongings in his collection as artifacts yanks them out of a relational context and inserts them into the framing of his Old West, where they become operative of a salvage ethnography predicated on assimilation of native people. Russell positions himself here as a cultural broker for the Blackfeet people, and there is appropriation and erasure in that power imbalance, especially as he renders a nostalgic pre-contact past that elides the realities of cultural suppression, political repression, and dispossession of Native people in the Northern Plains. Although there were a few brief instances in which Russell did get involved um, in favor of Native people in establishing land um, uh, reservations that I'm happy to talk about too in the Q&A. But present day viewers risk reasserting that colonial perspective by continuing to read these belongings as mere props. Reading native art in settler context in this way and otherwise re reifies settler intent as interpretation. Western painters like Russell occupy a position of representational power that allows them to putatively own objects and their meanings. As Foster and Evans put it, Quote, the imposition of colonial ontological frames of representation is fundamentally colonizing because it forecloses the agency, art practice, and politics of native artists and belongings by implying that they yield and bend to settler intentions, flattened metaphorically as they're translated by artists like Russell in two dimensions. To be sure, Native American art is being trafficked through a painting like this, but as this talk is suggesting, these belongings are also traveling through it. And I'm offering an intellectual intervention here to show instead Russell's dependence on indigenous knowledge as conveyed by his model and by the belongings in his collection and to a degree on Blackfoot art and design. The concept of expressive culture central to Plains Lifeways, particularly its emphasis on relationality between human and non-human realms, fundamentally differs from Russell's use for the belongings in his own cultural practice. What methods are needed to restore this embedded relationality? I propose that in discussing representations of Native American art and belongings, the field of Western American art history has long neglected the extensive work on indigenous epistemologies in the field of Native American and indigenous studies, in Native American art history, and in missed opportunities of dialogue with many Native knowledge keepers. We need to engage a, a methodology that is emic, which is a term that means drawing on analysis based on a culture's internal systems and meanings, rather than imposing external frames of reference. An emic method takes seriously the Blackfoot and other indigenous meanings that are embedded in the belongings in Russell's collection, restoring them and centering them in analysis, and amplifying what knowledge is deemed by communities to be shareable about them. Indeed, the native belongings that Western artists acquire do not acquiesce to their appropriation, and this is a subject for a larger book project of which this um, text will be a part. Recognizing that the operations of Native American societies and worldviews and cultural belongings are incommensurable with Western epistemologies and the visual practices of settler society, we need to engage new tools to build mutually coextensive expertise and to accommodate both modes of looking simultaneously. And I think that more of this kind of dialogue will enable us to entwine what have been long two siloed fields of art history and reinterpret Western representations of native belongings as a contest of epistemologies and as a transnational dialogue of multiple makers. And some of this work is being done um, in the work of curator Annika Johnson at the Jocelyn, for instance, um, UNCG professor Emily Volker, um, also the work of Scott Manning Stevens, uh, to name a few. Russell's paintings depend on these belongings to substantiate their own claims, but that relationship is not reciprocal. The native belongings supersede the painting, and the painting becomes a stopover on their larger journey. Here we can draw on Rosemary Joyce's work on object itineraries to trace belonging significations in a variety of contexts. And this enables us to also kind of trace a shifting meaning and context over time, um, where we can find spatial and temporal mobilities and focus attention, importantly, on the relationality of things. <clears throat> 
Recognizing the uneasy coexistence of contingent perspectives and recentering native ontologies and epistemologies in Russell's studio and paintings recuperates sub sublimated but ongoing challenges to settler colonialism through visual sovereignty. Western paintings such as In the Wake of the Buffalo Hunters and the belongings it depicts are aspirational and incipient. They have a kind of wistful longing to collect, to gather um, societies that could never be totalizing because of the way that they are dependent on these belongings in order to tell that story. To perceive this relationality, we need new stories and to ask new questions about the belongings that circumnavigate the painting and often even to those which are unrendered. And I'll conclude with a later photograph um, from Russell's collection, which depicts Wright visiting with the Russells, sitting on the ground coated with crispy autumn leaves. Propped up against a pole is a baby, perhaps hers and Tharp's, tucked into a beaded cradle board. This intergenerational connection, filtered through a design imbued with love, opposes the violence of extraction or erasure and activates the relationality of the belonging. The cradle board from the photograph remains in Russell's studio collection, and you see it photographed at right. Thank you, Sarah, for the photograph. Um, and this appears to be a flathead cradle board, every bit of its backing crowning the child with brightly colored beads in green, pink, red, and blue, with red wool embossed with sinuous flowering stems. Its symmetrical design prescribes a sense of order and balance in the universe. The floral motifs signify growth and flourishing, a multi-generational transfer of relational knowledge, which continues to be embedded in Northern Plains belongings and paintings of them. Thank you so much. It's a little hard to see, but I'm happy to take questions if people have them or comments. Oh, yes. Yeah, first, thanks, Emily, for being here, for sharing your work with us. Um, I'm really curious of what you're looking forward to as you visit Blackfeet communities. You said you have an upcoming visit. Yeah. And obviously you have some larger questions you want to ask, but yeah. in terms of your own relationality, like, yeah. What is it you're hoping to achieve in that space? Yeah, thank you so much. So most of the scholarship that I have done so far related to Native communities has focused on the Lakota Nation um, because that's the uh, place where Wild West performers mostly came from. Um, and I have been working with community members since about 2013 on that work. Um, but thinking about the uh, Northern Plains in a different way through Blackfoot context is relatively new to me. Um, and so it's my hope to have conversations with contemporary beaters. Um, there are also some contemporary um, Blackfeet painters who sort of do Charles Russell in their style. And I'm really interested to think about um, the legacy of these paintings um, for Blackfeet um, people. Um, there are a few publications already to build on. Um, George Horse Capture, who is from Fort Belknap, has written an essay on what people remember from conversations about Russell from that period. Um, so I'm interested in thinking about the legacy of Russell and also in a deeper understanding so much as I can be permitted to access about the belief systems that beating is enacting. And I think that will come from talking to contemporary beaters. I'm really, I admire so much um, Heather Caverhill, who's just finishing a dissertation at the University of British Columbia. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, University of Alberta. But she's working on Vinald Rice, who was working um, in Glacier National Park basically in the two decades following Russell. And she has been able to identify and, and meet with and talk with um, descendants of people he painted. And um, her dissertation is really stitching together this like multinational art colony around rice. Um, and I, I think it could be interesting to think about what threads of that can we also find in Russell's practice, but all of that would emerge out of building kind of a long-term um, conversation uh, with community members. I also just um, very generously, um, OU gave a new um, kind of arts and humanities research grant that will fund my travel there, but um, it will also fund travel for the people that I meet to come to OU for a symposium next spring to talk about um, exactly this issue. So I'm hoping for lots of longstanding conversations. Thanks for the question. Hi, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, could you maybe just say a little bit more about um, how much Russell cared about the original use or meaning or purpose of some of these belongings for him in his collection? Yeah. You know, where was the line between um, you know decoration and the actual meanings that are encoded and stored within these objects? Yeah, thank you so much. The question is about Russell's perceptions of the materials that he's collecting. It's a hard question to answer because Russell didn't write a lot about what he was collecting. And I think there are things we can glean about the fact that he would sometimes adapt things that he acquired and that he would also sometimes try to produce his own versions of things that he acquired that would suggest that um, he is engaging from a more surface level. Um, and like I said, I haven't seen any place where he's kind of writing deeply about what these meanings are. And I think I'm also careful that I don't, I, in some ways in this project, it doesn't concern me so much what he knew or didn't know or what he cared about or not, because I think the meanings are operating outside of that, you know, irrespective to that. Um, but it is something that I'm kind of still looking for as I, as I track through the materials. Um, but in the kind of bigger project, um, there's a couple of other artists who are doing similar things. Um, there's an artist named DeCoste Smith, who's, I think I brought an image in, um, who was uh, working with Edwin Deming, um, and they were both in the Northern Plains um, in uh, the 1880s, and they bought a ton of belongings and used them in their paintings. And as with Russell's collection, which is still in his studio, the DeCoste Smith objects are all in the Museum of the American Indian. And so what excites me about these examples is that if I can engage with the actual belonging and the representation of it, I think it enables me to stitch a really um, interesting story that really hasn't been offered before in the history of of Western American art. And what's exciting about this case is that um, Deming and DeCoste Smith were taking notes on who they bought things from. And so it's actually possible to know like whose war bonnet this is. Um, and um, incidentally, I have gone into a rabbit hole on this, but the man whose war bonnet it is was also an artist. And he made this massive muslin um, in 1889, which he sold to Deming, who was with Smith. And this belonging is in the uh, Brooklyn Museum, and I just got to see it in December. And so I think that, like I think about uh, objects like this, like that flathead cradle board that are not actually pictured um, by the artists as far as I've seen, but they are kind of concurrent with and sort of dancing around that I think can really expand um, the voices um, that are building narratives um, in 19th century painting. Thanks for that question, Kenneth. Hi. Hi. Um, do we? Do, you might have mentioned this, but does um, is Russell's collection and art entirely focused on like Blackfoot and that like and those tribes in that area, or does he expand to like other tribes throughout uh, throughout the North America? Yeah, that's a great question. The question was, does Russell focus on um, Northern Plains and Blackfoot in particular, or is it more expansive? He is largely focused on the Northern Plains, but even that he's using a Kiowa cradle board in a painting of a black foot person is a bit complicated, but I also don't want to assume, because I know it's not true, that objects didn't travel, belongings traveled all the time across communities through trade. So there would have been Kiowa cradle boards in the Northern Plains. But there are occasions where he does engage with belongings in ways that are totally incongruous. Like there's a watercolor that I was looking at in the Eamon Carter where he is painting Lewis and Clark's meeting with the Mandan people in the 18, um, or early 19th century. And he uses like um, Klingit and Haida motifs from Alaska in this like uh, Missouri River boat. So like there are times where it's um, sort of, um, flexibly adapted, we might say, but largely focused on that region. Hey. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Yeah, I'm just curious how objects um, fit into this discourse. I think that um, that distinction you're making between belongings and objects is really powerful. Um, it sounded like you made sort of a lexical shift to belongings to objects when you're talking about um, things made for internal use this thing made for trade. Yeah. And I wonder, so are, are objects in that paradigm, what is their value as, as 
thing you want to analyze and account for? Mm -hmm. Does it lose its expressive power because of the, its intended uh, purpose? And it also seems like it's analogous to performance mm -hmm. in the way that indigenous peoples perform for internal purposes versus external. How do we think about the relationship between those two categories? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think that I just used objects intending to use belongings in that response. And it's interesting because as an art historian, like objects is the word we use. And so it has been a lot of like retraining for me actually to try to, to be that specific. But I do think that you're right that as I go forward with this material, I need to think more about like when is something a belonging versus an object and is every native made thing a belonging? You know, I had this conversation a bit with Scott Manning Stevens for about an essay he's working on for the Art and Empire volume um, because I think he uses it more selectively than I do. Um, and so I think it's something that I need to think through. But again, what's complicated too in this history is that so many things are made for trade always. Like the, this is a Hopi blanket that was bought by DeCoss Smith in the Northern Plains where it had obviously been for many decades before he acquired it. And there are also examples of Navajo blankets that were adapted by Lakota people who added like other medallions and beadwork onto them. And so like objects are made for trade beyond like kind of localized communities anyway. Um, and so it becomes really complicated to think about like what is internal and what is external in this context. Um, but back to um, your question and the sort of the black feet dress, I'm really interested to know about, um, like my sense from talking to Heather about her conversations with contemporary beaters is that there was some protocol deciding which beadwork was meant for ceremony and which beadwork was meant for circulation in other contexts. And I think that that could be the semantic line, perhaps. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think about like the labor and the energy and the kind of beliefs that go into making the dress that Russell had versus those other dresses. And for me, they're all expressions of Blackfeet culture, even if one is a more controlled version of it. So I guess in that framing, both are belongings. But yeah, it's complicated. Let's give Emily a big hand.